So I'll ask Vivian Guerin um, to kick proceedings off. Vivian was appointed director of the probation service in 2012. I'm under strict instructions not to give him a very lengthy um, introduction, but you know him well, and he is um, in charge of the offender assessment and suspicion <coughs> programs, also a member of the Pearl Force, and of course, a member of the very important strategic review group on criminal policy that published in September. So Vivian, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, and thank you very much, uh, Deirdre. And I also want to start off by saying a sincere thank you to the School of Law at UCC and particularly to Ashling Parks and Fiona Donson for their kind invitation to present here today. I also want to start off by saying that the crime deserves to be addressed, has to be addressed, and offenders deserve to be punished. But punishment should be uh, a number of things, including just appropriate, humane and proportionate. And it's, it's for that reason that I selected this title for, for my presentation, which uh, we'll be looking at whose sanction is it anyway. And while we may have a particular target in mind as a society uh, and as various parts of the criminal justice system for, uh, for a particular sanction, that there very often are, it can be and are collateral consequences to that punishment. And earlier on, Tanya pointed out, um, Tanya Ward, that the criminal justice system tends to focus on specific individuals. Uh, primarily, and certainly from my point of view, it tends to focus on the, on the offender. And in certain scenarios, um, and more widely now, I think, there is an increased focus on the situation and the role of victims within the criminal justice system. But there is clearly a significant collateral impact on a range of other people and specifically family members, whether family members of offenders as we're speaking about today, um, and also particularly children. So in terms of my presentation, um, I'm, I'm going to say a little bit about the uh, probation and prisons context in Ireland, the criminal justice system and who or what is the focus of our attention. I also want to point to the cyclical nature of a lot of the issues, including the impact of and on family relations. Uh, also to look at things in terms of this topic from a slightly different perspective, uh, insofar as it impacts on the, on the actual and potential impact on uh, influencing desistance from crime by offenders, and also some future possibilities. I do want to pay some attention to the needs and rights of the child. Um, you know, what, uh, for example, that uh, contact with their parents while they're in prison, let's say, is a good thing per se. Uh, for example, under art, uh, um, instruments like the, Europe or the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. But I also want to look at some of the other practical benefits, including, as I said, the possibilities for better interventions in, in this area being a tool for promoting offenders' desistance from crime. And as I said, I also want to refer to the cyclical nature of what we are speaking about in terms of the impact on children, on offenders, of offenders on children, uh, and ultimately on what we do in relation to crime and offending. So as far as the probation service is concerned, I'm just going to give a brief uh, snapshot overview, if you like, uh, of what we do. And I've, I, I, I certainly find this map useful in the sense that it illustrates and demonstrates how the probation service operates right across the country in communities uh, right across Ireland and we have offices in every uh, single county in the country. We, at, at any one point, any one day, we are working with eight and a half thousand offenders in the community uh, as well as having staff located in all of the 14 custodial institutions. And. Uh, we have a budget of just over 37 million euro, around 395 uh, staff. So the two agencies that I'm, that I'm just going to say a little bit about, as well as the probation service, is the Irish Prison Service. I'll speak about that in, in a couple of moments. And the uh, Irish Prison Service and Probation Service between us are the two main agencies responsible for the management of offenders, both in custody and in the community, on supervised sanctions anyway. So the role of the probation service is to manage 
court orders and in doing that to reduce the risk of harm to the public and the risk of reoffending by offenders under our care and also to work to make good the harm done by crime. Specifically what we do in my view breaks down into two broad areas. We're involved in offender assessment and we carry out assessment reports for the courts and also for other bodies uh, such as the parole board and then following on from that our, the bulk of our work is in relation to uh, the supervision of offenders which is focused on rehabilitation in order as I said to reduce risk of harm and reduce uh, the uh, incidence of reoffending. And we've, we've been reasonably successful <coughs> at that. For the first time uh, in the past couple of years, we've joined up ourselves, the Irish Prison Service, uh, have linked up with the Central Statistics Office to produce recidivism studies. And roughly around 60% uh, of the people we supervise uh, on various types of probation supervision do not go on to reoffend within the following um, three years. And our, our, our next recidivism studies will be published next year, 2015. And uh, ironically, or not ironically, the, the, the finding for people who've been to prison is the reverse. Uh, broadly speaking, around 60% of people who have been to prison do reoffend within the following three years. <coughs> Moving on then to the, the issue of imprisonment, which is, in a sense, as far as, as far as sanctions for offenders are concerned, is at the sharp end, really. It's the ultimate sanction that we, that we have in this country, as in most other countries. And I've just used a, an illustration here of the global rates of imprisonment. And you'll see there, in terms of the colours, the, the countries that are highlighted in red, for example, uh, places like the United States of America have, a, have, have the highest rates of imprisonment uh, per 100,000 of population. Um, although I was reading something recently that pointed out that the uh, overall rate of imprisonment within the United States is uh, somewhere around 700 uh, plus people per 100,000. But uh, I was reading recently that within the United States, the state of Louisiana has a rate of imprisonment of around 1,300. Uh, persons per 100,000 population. So even within uh, countries such as the United States, states, there can be huge variations in the rate of imprisonment. And Ireland stands at around 89 prisoners per 100,000. So you'll hear later on from, from Governor Pat Dawson about some of the specific work that the Irish Prison Service are doing. But again, I just wanted to give you an overview to, in, by, by way of contrast or, or comparison with the probation service. The Irish Prison Service, as I said, has 14 institutions um, in, in the country and they're illustrated there on the, on the map. Uh, recently, at the end of October, although the figure there is 4,444, the number actually in custody uh, recently stands at around 3,700. <coughs> and I've, I, I have a, a slide there that illustrates, as of the 31st of October, 2014, there were 3,775 3, uh, people in custody. Uh, 3,169 of those were sentenced prisoners, with 593 on remand. And of, uh, of the total, 140 were females, um, and eight were in custody on that date for, for non-payment of fines, uh, and 13 were in custody in relation to uh, extradition or immigration-related matters. The, we work very closely with the Irish Prison Service and it's important to point out that the, uh, the Irish Prison Service, as we do, have a, a three-year strategic plan and some of the areas that the Irish Prison Service are focusing on currently uh, in their strategy is in relation to reducing prison numbers on the basis that, uh, apart from anything else, it's, it's more uh, possible, more achievable to do uh, you know, positive things, positive programs and interventions when, when uh, institutions aren't overcrowded. Also, the whole issue of prisoner progression uh, towards normalization, progression and ultimately uh, reintegration into, into the community and the implementation of a wider range of prisoner related programs, more of which you'll hear about later on. 
And I, I was recently, or last Saturday, I was speaking at a conference with Michael Donnellan, the Director General of the Irish Prison Service, and he, he would point out that, uh, and this is directly relevant to our subject today, that he sees the next generation uh, of people, who, you know, many of whom will be the children of people currently imprisoned, uh, that next generation of potential prisoners is, is the real uh, challenge, in the sense that um, around 60% of male children of people currently in prison will end up spending uh, some time in prison in, in their own lives. Okay, just to move on then and speak a little bit about uh, childhood and parenthood impacted by punishment. And to some extent we have to ask ourselves, what are, what are people's experiences like? You know, what are our, our children's experiences like when their parents go to prison? And we do have the benefit uh, of some research in that area, particularly quite recently the Irish Penal Reform Trust published um, an excellent document on, on this whole area and um, I certainly feel there is a need for, for much more exploration in, in that area, in that uh, issue. Just last year I, I made a visit to a prison in Belgium and I was, I was going around the prison and at the stage when I went into the visiting area I was struck by the fact that there were different uh, completely different facilities within the same visiting area for different levels of security in terms of visits. So, you know, at the, at the lowest level of security, uh, I could see that it was possible for prisoners to meet with their families, with their children, in a very open environment. There were tables and chairs, like the kind of uh, uh, furniture you'd see in a McDonald's restaurant. There was a place where you could buy uh, refreshments and so on. There was a place for, for children to play a play area. There was even a place where children could have photographs taken with their with their parents. Mm -hmm. And then moving up from that in terms of security, there was a place where uh, the type of scenario I'd be more familiar with from seeing in our prisons where uh, you know prisoners could meet with, with their visitors over a kind of a counter with a, 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 a sort of a low uh, division in between. And then there were also facilities for within rooms that were you know completely separated by uh, a barrier and you know floor to ceiling glass and so on but in in speaking with the staff there i was struck by the fact that you know i was saying how do people earn the right to move to the lower level of security in when they meet their children and the governor there was telling me no 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 that's not the way we operate here uh, when you come to prison you're automatically granted the right for the for the free association you know the, you have full rights in terms of your children's visitation. It's only if you, if you break the rules that you move up the next step. And for me, in terms of changing mindsets and changing minds, that was a really significant uh, way of approaching. And certainly in my mindset uh, and my experience, you know, we tend to operate at the, at the highest level of security and then work downwards. And uh, in, in the scenario uh, in the um, Belgian prison where I, was, where I was visiting, it was completely different. <coughs> So one of the other areas that I think is important is that we often deal with men and women in, in a different way, men and women prisoners, and even in terms of you know, uh, consciousness of the need for parent and child contact while an individual is in prison uh, tends, in, in, in my own view, to be higher up the scale when the prisoner is a woman. You know, we tend to see the parenting role as being more clearly defined for women, and I think we're missing out on a huge uh, a huge area of possibility in that. Part of the reason for that, I think, is that male offenders tend to be seen and tend to be categorized in terms of risk uh, and dangerousness, and as a result, a lot of them tend to be ignored. And for, for a lot of people, particularly men, I think, the, the whole parenting role for them tends to be suspended to a large extent when they're in prison. And I think that's even true for the men themselves, for, for whatever reason, that they feel that they can only be a, quote, real parent, a real father, when they're in the community, and that's something that has to, has to be suspended when, they, when, they, when they're in, in prison. And just yesterday I was at a conference, a probation service staff conference, and there was a man uh, speaking at it, um, some of you may be familiar with him, Alan Weaver from Scotland, and he's somebody who spent a significant, num uh, significant period of time or periods of time in his teens and early 20s in prison. And uh, in more recent times, he's qualified as a social worker and he's currently 
working as a criminal justice social work team leader in Scotland. And I'm, I'm not speaking out of turn when I, when I say what I'm going to say about what he told us because he's written about it in his autobiography. But he spoke in among speaking about a whole lot of things to us. He spoke about his own experience of parenting, both of being parented and of being a parent in the context of his offending. And he spoke first of all about his his own experience of parenting in a home which, as he described, wasn't loveless, but it was certainly one marked by significant and brutal domestic violence perpetrated by his father. And the impact that had on him in propelling him even faster into a life of uh, violent and prolific and persistent offending. And then he spoke at another stage about the significant uh, <coughs> role models or influences on his life that he met. And the first of those was when he was in prison serving a sentence and he was befriended by a life sentence prisoner, somebody who had, um, a man who had committed murder, who was coming towards the end of a life sentence prior to being released, and somebody who had a very positive, a very big influence on Alan. And, you know, it's, it's something that one wouldn't give credit for, or it's probably the last place you would look for positive parenting influence. But he described that man as uh, giving him his first real uh, positive uh, father-like, father role model um, experience, uh, something that he hadn't, hadn't really experienced at home. He, he also spoke about, after he was released from prison, from one of his sentences, uh, the role that a social worker who had stuck with him uh, over, over a long period of time, the establishment of a stable relationship uh, you know, with the woman, uh, having his own children and so on. Um, and what he equally spoke of the opportunity that that gave him when, at one stage, when there was always a pull to get back involved in crime. And one time he said he left the house shortly after his first son was born. And uh, he, he, he left the house, as he described it, armed to the teeth to go and you know, lie in wait for somebody who he wanted to get revenge on for having uh, assaulted him very seriously earlier. And it was while he was out waiting for that man that he uh, something clicked in his head about you know what message am I what message am I giving to my own child what impact is that going to have on my child if I go ahead and do what I'm thinking about doing and he he ended up going back home but to complete the cycle and I mentioned earlier on about the the cyclical nature of what we're speaking about to complete that cycle he described then how uh, how his son Alan's son now has children of his own and when Alan sees his son parenting his children, Alan's grandchildren in turn, uh, and the positive father relationship that he has with them, he's quite clear that he sees that he has been instrumental in breaking the cycle of uh, negativity because he sees his son positively parenting his, his own children. So if, if he hadn't himself broken his own link with offending, uh, you know, hadn't stopped, stopped being involved in violent crime, he's convinced that that would have passed on through the next um, generation. Now for, for offenders who are before the courts or in custody, the issue of their children and the parenting role is, is a huge issue and it's something that's extremely painful and extremely difficult. And at the same time, when I was thinking about this presentation, I was thinking back over different experiences that I've had within the criminal justice system, system as a probation officer and so on. And I've certainly over the years come across a lot of cynical views of children of offenders. Uh, the idea that the child of a, a person who's currently offending has no hope. Um, that you know, every, every offender who appears before the court, or every second offender, seems to, have, seems to be expecting a child next week. Or, you know, this, this cynical idea that um, offenders want to use their children in a way that, that, that helps them out. Um, also the view, you know, that uh, in relation to children visiting uh, parents in prison, that they're, you know, sometimes may be used for um, smuggling contraband or whatever. So there is, there is a very... Um, a very cynical view that can creep into all of us, and I've certainly come across that, that myself. And Judge Alvy Sachs spoke earlier on about that idea of imposing a destiny on children. It's, it's something that's very hard to get away with when you're working with offenders within the, in the criminal justice system. <coughs> and I want to refer here to um, a, a colleague of mine, one of our probation officers, Helen Lowe, who recently completed a, um, a master's in social work 
and completed her dissertation on fatherhood in prison as a tool for desistance. And in reading her dissertation, I found it really useful, as I said earlier on, not just to look in terms of the rights of children as positive rights per <coughs> se, but that there are actually other benefits. And I think this is a very helpful way of, of looking at this subject because the more, the more positivity, the more side benefits that you can build in, uh, I think, creates a better momentum for, for, for um, achieving positivity. So Helen pointed out that there has been a lot of research uh, of imprisonment uh, in terms of the impact on children, but that there has been little research on the impact on parenting, and especially on fatherhood, as I mentioned. That parenting and fatherhood is seen by prisoners that is something that is only possible, as I mentioned, on the outside, and as a result that fatherhood is suspended. And she, she goes on to point out the, uh, in, a, in a more macro way, I suppose, something that was pointed out yesterday by Alan Weaver when he spoke about his own experience, the positive um, impact, positive or negative impact, that parenting uh, as a child, that parenting as a parent can have on, on, on whether somebody ultimately uh, can be helped to desist from crime. And I, I also want to point out in this regard that the, uh, the role of uh, NGOs and, and various organizations, and I'm delighted to see so many uh, of them here today, uh, has in this area. And I certainly find as somebody working within the statutory sector that that, that is something that is extremely positive and helpful. And you will hear later on from, uh, from Governor Pat Dawson, uh, from Larry De Clare, and from Laura and Lisa about some of the, actual, some of the practical uh, initiatives currently ongoing. So clearly there is a benefit, uh, as has been evidenced, and Helen Lowe certainly gathered up evidence from, from her literature review for the positive uh, potential impact on desistance from crime when, when we focus on uh, the parenting role, not just on the, on the impact on children, but also the other side of that cycle. And I, I would suggest there is a need to integrate what we do in terms of that parenting role, that role with children of offenders and children of prisoners, with other services, particularly services in relation to prisoners, such as education, psychology, probation, uh, and so on. Earlier on, I mentioned the fact that the prison service and the probation service have a joint strategic plan, as well as, as, as having our own separate strategies. And they're focused on integrated offender management programs that operate both within the prisons and then preparing people for community reintegration. And I'll, I'll be re-emphasizing that uh, over, the, over the last couple of minutes of what I have to say, that I firmly believe the, the need to coordinate and integrate services um, within the statutory sector and more broadly within the uh, various other services and NGOs working with offenders is critical. And we, and we do also need to involve wider uh, social services as well. Now that can be more, more of a challenge sometimes, but I, I really think the, the, the wider uh, and, and the more coordinated of an approach that we can use, the better, and, and we will end up with better outcomes. Some of the issues that we have tried to address in our joint strategy is that recognition of the value of coordination, the identification and clarification of shared goals, setting that out in a joint strategy. We, ha we also have a co-located unit now where staff from the Irish Prison Service are located in our uh, headquarters in Dublin, probation headquarters. We, we hold joint management meetings, we share data, and we carry out joint research. <coughs> Moving back then to the specific area of children within the criminal justice system, I, I'm certainly a firm believer that the Children Act 2001 has been a hugely beneficial, a hugely positive addition to the whole area of legislation. We've followed that by the establishment of a specific division for young people who offend, young persons probation. Um, and people who work in that area carry out family conferences. Uh, some of our staff have also been really strong in developing the Strengthening Families program uh, here in Ireland. It's a program that started in, in, in the US and Rosemary Fox, one of our senior probation officers uh, from Cork, 
Uh, and again, as Albie Sachs said, I think that there is something about Cork that, uh, that generates a whole lot of positive things. But the uh, Strengthening Families program now is uh, right across the country. Again, critically, I think it's an interagency program. So it's, it, it involves probation, the HSE, and a whole lot of other organizations. It's very often um, coordinated through the local drugs task forces and so forth. Um, and since 2007, that, that, that has been developed. One of the key things about the Strengthening Families program, or two of the key things, I think, really, is uh, I, and I, I've been at some of their um, final uh, events, if you like. Um, and what has struck me and, and participants have told me is how it helps uh, participants not just to rebuild relationships within families, and, uh, but also to rebuild relationships with services like the probation service, like the child and family agency, uh, and so forth, that, that might have been fractured and fractious over the years, and helps families parents and children to rebuild those relationships. The other critical um, strength of it is that participants are uh, seen as a resource and that, that people within the one family are seen as a resource to each other, but equally people from other families who participate in, in, the, in the Strengthening Families program are seen and are, and are utilized as, as a resource. And, and um, I think this week in Cork, uh, one of the Strengthening Families programs commenced again, uh, and has uh, will run over over the next number of weeks. It's it it basically involves bringing the parents uh, and children together one evening a week over over several weeks, and uh, in a facilitated and a led way, addressing issues and having inputs from various services. But as I say, in a in a in an inclusive, participatory, and non-threatening way. And. Uh, I, I would suggest as well it does what it says on the on the tin. The the family is called or the program is called strengthening families, and that's what it what it aims to do. Okay, moving on then to look at some future possibilities and limitations as well. Um, the uh, penal policy review group, which Deirdre mentioned in the introduction, I think will be very significant. Uh, the report of the, of the group of which I was a member and it had representatives from across the criminal justice system. The report was published by the Minister for Justice, Francis Fitzgerald, in September, and it makes 43 recommendations. And some of those include that prison should be seen as a last resort and that community-based <coughs> sanctions should be seen as a first resort. But specifically, recommendation 25 uh, says that all criminal justice agencies should work to promote contact between offenders and their children and other family members where such contact is appropriate. In particular, the Irish Prison Service should work to, to ensure that conditions for visits as well as decisions regarding the denial of visits are sensitive to the needs of children. And I, I'm confident uh, that that report you know, will, be, will be actioned just this week. Uh, a group is being put together um, initiated by the Minister and the Department of Justice to, to uh, implement those 43 recommendations. Okay, I'm coming towards the end and I just want to show you a, a, a two minute uh, video. But just before I do, I, I want to emphasize the cyclical and interconnected nature of this uh, issue. Uh, we do like to categorize people, and I include myself in that, we do like to categorize people as offenders or victims, as parents or children. But very often the people we're working with are both offenders and victims. Some of the children that we supervise on um, probation supervision are also parents. Uh, so there's a whole, a whole intermeshing, a whole cyclical nature, as I said. And yet the imperative, as is being pointed out today, is to focus on children's rights, and that is, and, and, and certainly that is, is clear. So we, we have made and we continue to make progress, but we can still do a lot better. The Penal Policy Review Group report gives us a clear roadmap, and uh, Tanya earlier on also spoke about the great opportunity in terms of legislation, uh, leadership, and the need to be inspired. But equally, there's an onus on all of us to try and do a bit of the inspiring ourselves. I've already mentioned the value of the inputs by the non-governmental organizations, 
Um, later on as well, we'll hear from people from St. Nicholas's Trust, and I'm delighted to see Mairead Carmody, one of our probation officers here today as well, who's been very much involved with that. And for me, I think some of the issues we deal with are complex, but the responses don't have to be complicated. They also don't necessarily have to be uh, resource intensive, they don't have to be costly. And I would suggest that the biggest change that we need to make, and this goes back to the title of today's conference, is for a, a, a mindset change and to reverse our thinking. So on that note, Is it working? Yeah. There's no sound. thinking of saying at the start there, there's a there's a benefit and a danger in speaking in, in this slot I mean it was absolutely fantastic to be speaking directly after Justice Albie Sachs I felt no pressure <laughs> <laughs> equally another advantage to some extent but I'm going to bow down at this stage is that you can get things in that other people might want to get in <laughs> later on so I won't show this uh, this short clip because one of the one of the presenters later on is going to do it and I'll finish on, on that note so thank you very much